Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the in dark. dark. Tales from the Road, Volume 11, Story 1. A few years back, I was driving home after a shift. It was 3 or 4 a.m., and I was tired, but not exhausted. It's a deserted state route in the middle of nowhere, and it's pretty common not to see a single car during the 30-mile trip. I drive this road multiple times a week. It's mostly open fields and some farmland through this 30-mile stretch. This particular night, it was cold, but the sky was clear, like no clouds or anything, and I actually love nights like this because you can see the stars so well without light pollution. Anyway, about halfway back home, I come over this hill to a two- or three-mile stretch, it's just straight road, and there's a huge dark object about the length of a pickup truck, but far rounder and thicker catches my attention as it's just hovering about 50 feet in the air, 50 or 60 feet off the road over a farm field. There's a very bright red light coming out of the side or bottom. I couldn't tell exactly where it originated from because it was so bright. As I was going about 50 miles per hour past it, I only had a few seconds to look at it but the image is burned into my mind. I have no idea what it was. I wanted to turn around, but I was kind of freaked out. I'm sure alien life exists somewhere, but as for visiting our planet, I don't know. But if I ever had to paint a picture of what I think a UFO could look like, I'd paint whatever the F I saw that night. Unfortunately, I haven't seen anything odd over that area since that night. Story number two. Well, I wasn't going on the road exactly. I was up in the air. And it's probably the creepiest thing I've heard, which was a distress call of a small general aviation aircraft going down. This was around 2014 in the Pacific Northwest. The guy had just blown a cylinder head and oil was shooting out all over his windshield. You could hear the panic in his voice as he radioed out that he couldn't see and was trying to report his position to a few airliners so that they could relay it to ATC. I checked the news that night and he actually died in the crash. It was a pretty eerie feeling that we heard the last few words of a pilot fighting for his life while we were just cruising along above the clouds at 35,000 feet, completely powerless to do anything other than reach out to him over the radio. Had a pretty wild encounter with some scarred toothless meth tweakers on a layover in Ciudad Juarez and this is the story. I've flown to some odd destinations, but one of the creepiest was Ciudad Juarez. Me and two flight attendants were bored on an El Paso layover, so we decided to get drinks at around 11 p.m. We drank until the bars closed at 2, and on the way out we asked the bartender if anything else was still open. Not unless you want to go to Ciudad Juarez, he joked. I looked at the flight attendants, we shrugged, nodded, and said, okay. He was shocked that we took him seriously. We walked a short distance back to the hotel, grabbed our passports, and set out for Mexico. Before we left, I asked the flight attendants, both women, if they were sure they were okay with this. Yeah, sure, as long as you're coming too. Liquid Courage had officially overruled any fears of being kidnapped or beheaded, and off we went. So we walked 20 minutes south to the border. El Paso was completely dead quiet, aside from a few homeless people, some of them stumbling around and clearly under the influence of drugs, but none of them bothered us. We reached the Mexican border, and the guards took an extra second to look at the three crazy gringos before waving us through. It was close to 3 a.m. at this point, and we were three twenty-somethings wandering around the streets of Ciudad Juarez at night. I'm not sure how much you know about Ciudad Juarez, but it isn't exactly safe at night, especially for non-locals. The streets were pretty empty, and not a single bar was open. But everyone we passed stopped mid-conversation and stared at us as we walked by. The flight attendants were getting nervous, and we were walking so close to me that we were brushing up against each other. After determining that everything within a realistic distance of the border was closed, we turned around to head back to the U.S. We'd probably been in Ciudad Juarez for around an hour and somehow managed to navigate down the dark and deserted streets onto the same strip that we entered. By this point, we were close enough to the border that there were a few street lights that were still on. All of a sudden, two locals stumbled out from the dark sidewalks into the street, which we were walking down the middle of. As they came into the light... 
all three of us jumped at what we saw. A man and a woman, both with scarred faces, hunched backs, excessive sweat, ripped clothing, and missing teeth, were grinning as they approached us. The man was half speaking Spanish, half laughing. The startle factor of their approach combined with their appearance stands out as one of the biggest jump scares in my life. After realizing they weren't trying to kill us, yet, I figured, screw it. We'd come this far. Why not throw a Hail Mary? To my own disbelief, I actually tried to communicate with the man and asked if he knew of any bars that were open. By this point, the flight attendants were so terrified that each one had latched themselves onto one of my arms. In any situation other than the one we were currently in, I'd have looked pretty cool. The man simply smiled, pointed behind him and said, Por allá, over there. There was a motel with all the lights turned off except for a steady red light on the front balcony and a light flickering from inside a room on the second floor. One of the flight attendants turned and said into my ear, No, no way. We need to leave now. I thanked the man and woman for their time and we hightailed it to the U.S. border. They gave us a thorough questioning and rightfully so, as one man and two women crossing into the U.S. at around 4 a.m. reeks of human trafficking. Weirdly, the number of people huddled on the streets of El Paso has doubled. We'd speed walk back to our hotel. That layover definitely takes the cake for the creepiest thing to happen in the middle of nowhere. Next story. <clears throat> I had three friends helping me around midnight one night get a big toolbox into a storage unit before I could PCS to Texas. After, I offered to take them to Waffle House for food as payment, since it was about the only place open at the time. We left the unit around 2 a.m. and made our way to the Waffle House, driving through the Chickamauga Battlefield in Georgia to get to it. The place is terrifying to drive through on a regular night, but my friend and I thought we would have some fun with the other two who didn't grow up in the area. They didn't know any of the ghost stories of the park, so we told them some while we were driving to kind of spook them a bit. Ghosts on the sides of the road, green eyes, a mysterious ghostly panther creature, the hill your car will roll up when off, rearview mirror ghosts, the works. We took a turn down a side road that leads to an old bridge that has the old stop and turn your engine off and it won't turn back on story. We get to the bridge, stop and turn off the engine. Sit for a minute, start it up and kept driving with no problem. Nothing happened, just some harmless college kid fun. We drove over it and went around a corner and standing in a ditch is a black mass just larger than a man. It doesn't move really and even though the headlights panned across it directly, none of us could tell what it was. It was just black. All four of us screamed and I gasped it out of there nearly sliding in the ditch to get away. All of us saw it and none of us could explain what it was and still have no idea what it is through all these years afterwards. Next story. This is a story that my dad told me. It was when he was backpacking alone with his dog on the Pacific Crest Trail in Northern California in the late 70s. My dad had parked his car on the side of a highway and he and his dog were about seven miles down the trail. It was getting to be late in the afternoon so he was hoping to find a place to spend the night. Suddenly his dog started to make a low growl and the hair on her back stood up. My dad was thinking there was possibly a bear or something nearby as his dog was a very experienced backpack dog and was not easily rattled by things. He looked around, didn't see anything. He noticed that Mika is basically pointing out a spot in the trail with her nose a little bit ahead of them. He decided to walk up and see what she's looking at, and there he finds a massive footprint. To hear him describe it, this footprint was larger than anything a human could make, extremely deep and had claw punctures. He stood and stared at it in disbelief for at least five minutes because he didn't understand how this could possibly be on the trail. He thought perhaps it was a hoax or folks messing around, but he hadn't seen a soul and he was in the middle of nowhere. Who would come out to the middle of the trail where there are hardly any hikers and make a hoax footprint of some sort? And why was the dog so upset? He said he couldn't explain it, but he basically had this feeling of terror and turned around on the trail right then. He didn't know if it was his mind playing tricks on him but he swore he heard sounds in the trees nearby that sounded like a large animal as he booked it out. His dog remained completely alarmed the whole hike back, whimpering and pacing, which was out of character. He said he basically ran seven miles back down the trail as fast as he could go with his pack on and tore out of there in his car. To this day, he still claims it was one of the freakiest things he's ever experienced. Next story. 
My father was a truck driver for many years, and he had told me he had one of his scariest moments while he was driving a big rig. It was several years ago. I'm not sure how many, at least 15, 20, maybe more. He was driving at night in Indiana, I believe, and a van pulled up next to him, and they were faster, and they were in the next lane, and then suddenly the side door of the van is in front of the truck, and the sliding side door opens, and they toss a guy out in front of the truck so he'd get hit, and of course, that's what happened. He said he felt sick, and especially when he felt the dude making his way under the truck. Turns out the dude was dead before being tossed out the van, something like a mob execution. Another was when he was working at night doing repos. He was passing through a city around home and saw a dude on a crotch rocket crash. And the guy was really unlucky and got decapitated by those aluminum guardrails on the side of the highway, mainly for exits. But there are some before a bridge and that lead up to it. The helmet was still spinning by the time cops got there. Head was still inside. Then there was another time that he was repoing at night by himself. By then he'd done it for several years and he would sometimes take a friend with him if they wanted to make some extra money helping him or they were bored. Well one night my dad went out by himself like most times and went to a house where the vehicle he was looking for was last seen or was the last on a dress for the vehicle. He usually would try to just get it without disturbing anyone and most of the time he wouldn't need to as the dealerships would send him the key codes and he'd cut his own keys at home with a key machine. Well. He's getting the car and hooking it up while he's situating the car. He doesn't hear the guy come up behind him and crack him in the head with a PVC pipe. Splits my dad's head and my dad gets to his truck, reaches in and grabs his mag light. The big one, anyone who knows what a mag light is, you know they're heavy duty and the big ones are really solid. While he turns around with it and busts the dude in the face with it and goes to fight off the dude's grown son, but the son backs off. Dad sent that guy to the hospital with a broken jaw and a broken nose in an ambulance. He refused help, finished the hookup on the car, grabbed a rag in his truck for his head, and drove to the hospital to wind up getting ten staples in the back of his head. But by God, he got that damn car. Next story. I used to team drive with my buddy, and he was night blind, so I got the night shift. It was about 3 a.m. and we were driving through central Oregon and I had two trailer tires blow. So I pulled off the side of the road right near an exit for Dead Man's Pass. I woke my buddy up so we inspected the blowout and started getting a hold of someone to come and fix the tire. While we waited for a callback, we both noticed an eerie light coming from the edge of the woods off the highway about 40 yards away in front of the truck. Mind you, it's an extremely remote area in which we had not seen a town or light in probably two or three hours and hadn't even seen another vehicle for an hour or so. We had some time to kill, so we started to walk up and see what was causing the light. We got about 10 yards away from the source to discover that it was a goat hanging upside, suspended from two trees with Christmas lights wrapped around it and lit up. We did not know if it was a real goat or fake or how the Christmas lights were powered up. We immediately ran back to the truck and drove the bloating tire 70 miles to the nearest truck stop because we decided right then and there we were not going to stick around and find out the answers to those questions. Next story. I'm a rural sheriff's deputy in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. At that time, two of us would patrol almost 500 miles of road and it wasn't uncommon for weird shit to happen. These are the ones that I still can't explain. On patrol one night around 2 a.m., going down a pitch black, no moon country road, I'm traveling about 60-ish miles an hour and I come to a set of small rolling hills. I go down the first hill, back up, back down, and as I get to the bottom, there's a person right in front of my car. Looks like an old woman in a white gown. I know it sounds like every scary movie, but this is what happened, and I knew I was going to hit her. I locked up the brakes and she was dead center of my cruiser, about 10 or 15 feet out. I braced for impact and I guess I locked up the brake so hard that that old Crown Vic fishtailed at the last minute. She passed right beside my door and window. I could have reached out and grabbed her. Of course it all happened so fast it was a blur. No features on the person. I stopped. Thank God I didn't kill someone, especially an old woman who wandered out of her house. And you guessed it, she was gone. And to top it off, this was right next to an old church and cemetery. I looked and looked and yelled and never saw the woman again. 
Eventually I got creeped out and just left. I have no idea what the hell happened. There are no houses within miles of this church and cemetery. The second story is a few years later, before I can't remember at this point, this was decades ago. Some part of the county, not that far away actually, just a few miles from that same exact road. Similar time of night, I'm patrolling, I'm coming up to a giant stretch of the road that contained a four-way intersection. I see headlights approaching me and I slow down to come to a stop at the intersection. I realize after a few seconds the headlights are just sitting in the roadway about 100 or 150 yards away. Strange, but not the weirdest thing, it could be a drunk. I started driving up to see what's happening and the headlights go out. So I stop for a second and wonder what is happening. The lights come back on. I sit there for a second and both lights elevate about 10 to 12 feet off the ground and then come together to form a single bright light. At this point I'm starting to feel my skin crawl. The light immediately goes out. I turned all of my lights on and went down the road and trying to figure out what it was that I just saw. I came across nothing. No cars, farming equipment, nothing. There's no way whatever was in that road could have gotten around me or turned around and left without me seeing them. To this day, I have no clue what those lights were. Next story. I was parked for this one for the night. And that's why I remember exactly where I was at. It was US 6 in Golden, Colorado at a Kmart parking lot. Well, I had parked for the night and popped into the Kmart before it closed, presumably forever. Got the wife and I something to eat and some drinks, got back to my truck and fired up the microwave. Got the TV and Xbox going, I'm off duty and God damn it, I'm hungry. I just put disc three of season three of Game of Thrones in. Now five minutes later, someone knocked on my tractor door. First thought is, a lot lizard at Kmart? Bitch must be desperate. I grab my K-bar, and get in the driver's seat and roll the window down a little. Not a woman. Great. A pickler. Gross. I said, what you need, man? I'm trying to eat dinner and catch up on my show. He says, I was wondering if you could give me a ride to Denver. My brother's a trucker, too, and wants me to drive with him. And I say, go in the other way, and I don't have a third seat belt for you to use. And he says, I'm a trucker, too. And I said, okay, why doesn't your brother come get you? And he responds, he's busy. And I say, considering it's after 11 p.m., if he's busy, I'm sure it isn't with driving. He goes to reach for something. And then I said, yo, hands where I can see them. I'm not reaching for my gun in the door pouch. And he says, sorry, I just wanted to show you my CDL. And I said, bud, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm trying to enjoy my dinner and show. I'm not taking you anywhere. Best I can suggest is call your brother and have him come to get you. And then he says, my phone doesn't work. And I said, them's the brakes, man. There's probably the last payphone on earth next to the entrance. And he said, can you just open the door for a minute? And I said, no. And if you don't leave, I'm calling the police. Then he says, I'm just asking for some help. Which in turn, I said, I gave you the help I'm willing to offer. I'm rolling up the window now. Good luck getting to Denver. I rolled up the window, got in the bunk. Thought nothing more of it. When I got out to do my pre-trip in the morning, I discovered the little bastard tried to cut the lock off my trailer and open the doors. He'd have been pissed if he'd managed to open it. I lock up even when I'm deadhead. That trailer was empty. Real glad I didn't get the urge to open the door. God knows what he was planning. Kill me, steal my truck, rape and kill my wife was probably in the agenda too. Not the last time some shit that happened, but... I'll tell you about those stories another time. Next story. Back when my dad was a freight train driver, he had to stop at a red light in a wooded area in the middle of nowhere. The guard of the train, who's usually at the back of the train, radioed to tell him that it was going to take a while, so dad got out of his cabin and to take a leak. As he's watering the bushes, he saw a relatively well-dressed man approaching him, and he asked my dad to give him a lift to the nearest station. This man had a backpack and for some reason, an axe. Dad decided to give him a lift and asked him to take a seat in the cabin. All throughout the two-hour journey to the next station, the man didn't put down his backpack or his axe. He was eyeing him constantly through the corner of his eye and, and read a manic expression that you absolutely don't get from a lumberjack 
who had gotten off work at 2 a.m. After dropping off the man, the guard and my dad notified the cops and gave them the man's description. A month or so later, the department was issued a notice to not give lifts to strangers as the man they had picked up was a gang member and had just shot a man and buried him in pieces in that general vicinity. Next story. So, I'm an over-the-road truck driver in America. I generally stay in the Midwest as I enjoy the open road and less traveled areas. I tend to drive at night because the roads are a lot more empty and there tends to be less traffic slash construction going on around that time. Around this particular night, I was in Kansas making my way to Wyoming. I'd driven for hours at a time nonstop, so before my drive, I stack up on food and drinks. I've accustomed my bladder to hold going to the bathroom after years of truck driving until I can't hold it anymore. Now, in Nebraska, I get the urge to pee, so I start finding a part of the road that I'm able to pull over safely without damaging my tires. But this is the backwoods of the country, so finding this would be a little hard, but not impossible. When I finally feel that I've found a perfect enough location, I pull over. Since I'm in the middle of nowhere, I have nowhere to piss besides an empty gallon that contain water because there's no way I'm stepping outside in the dead of night. As I'm doing my business, I hear a tap. I do not want to make it known that I travel in my truck alone. I don't have a partner on the truck, nor a pet of any kind. The truck radio's off, the windows are up, and all you can hear from my perspective is the hum of the truck running. I begin to look for the sound which at first I thought was my mini fridge because when it gets unplugged, the melted water from the freezer will leak out and start to make a patter noise on the floor. I checked and it wasn't that, and in realizing this I noticed the tap sounded more like a small rock hitting the side of the truck, the driver's side in particular. Within my truck, I start to look outside of the driver window, but don't find anything in particular, so I start to look out of all the windows. I don't see anything anywhere, so I start to think it could be the truck itself. I get back in the driver's seat to get out of the truck to look under the hood. As I'm about to step out, another small rock hits my door, and I look out onto the side of the road where in the field stands these tall corn stalks. Keep in mind, corn stalks are tall. I mean, I'm standing on the top step of my truck and I can see right above them. And in looking out into the darkness, I see the top of someone's head, just the top. Not even a forehead, just their hair, which was black. The average height of a corn stalk is eight feet. So I don't know about you, but whoever that was had an advantage. I got back in the truck and locked the doors, put the windows down a tad bit and yelled, Hey, you need help? No answer. Hey man, you good? No answer. So I say, forget it and put the truck in gear and all that. I don't even look back just to try to get away from them in the area as fast as the truck will go after being at a standstill on the side of the road. I drove for hours until I reached Wyoming and pulled over at a truck stop to get some sleep. Before heading to sleep, I go inside the truck stop to get some food as I'm coming back to my truck, I see marks on the back of the passenger side of the truck as if someone had keyed my truck. I start angrily looking around to see who it could have been, but can't really come to a conclusion since most of the other drivers weren't in their front seat. Then I start looking around my entire cab and notice the marks are also on the back of the cab near the platform where the cab and trailer connect. I start remembering about the person I saw in the field and thought it was them, but I don't remember feeling anyone hop on the back there, so I was left puzzled. Nothing else happened for the rest of the day, thankfully. So I'm not sure who that person was, or what they wanted, or what their intentions even were. And I'm glad I never ended up finding out. Next story. This is my dad's story, and he's been a trucker for over 50 years. He tells us of these experiences when we ask otherwise. He doesn't really speak of them. One night, he was doing a long run. He knew he wouldn't make it home that night, so when he saw an old-looking pub up ahead, this is Ireland, he decided to park up for the night about 1.30 a.m. and get himself a nice pint. He went into the bar and thought everyone was dressed really old-fashioned and dancing. He thought nothing of it and got himself a guineas. He still says to this day it was the nicest pint he'd ever had in his entire life. After he finished his pint, the faces started to get fuzzy, he said it was like they were going out of focus, so he got back in the cab, pulled his curtains, and fell asleep. The next morning, 
when he woke up, he was going to get some breakfast and a coffee from the pub before he starts driving again. He pulled his curtains and saw the pub from last night was derelict and boarded up, untouched for many years. He has no explanation for it, but he knows it wasn't a dream. Next story. This happened on a road trip with my ex-girlfriend. We were headed to Eureka, California from Oregon and had to go on this Highway 299. We had a late start to our day, so it was nighttime by the time we set out on 299, thinking it would just be a normal stretch of rainy highway. We were thoroughly unprepared for how twisty and isolated it was. Midnight came and it had been pouring rain. Girlfriend was dodging rockfall for the entire drive so far and she was absolutely drained. We found a flat place to pull over for a quick nap, like a little outcrop of dirt alongside the road. The rain had stopped, but it was muddy, and man, was it quiet. Eerily so. We were both so drained, we just crashed for about 30 minutes or so in our respective seats. Keep in mind, we'd been on the road for a while and hadn't passed a single car the entire time. I woke up to the sound of scratching underneath the car that I brushed off as an animal. Then I heard steady plopping out in the mud, like someone was circling our car, but didn't see a damn thing. I elbowed my girl, thinking she was still asleep, but she was fully awake and frozen in place, and just said, I know. She said she had this feeling that something was off from the second we pulled into that spot. We held deathly still for a bit longer, still reckoning it was a deer or something, in denial. I got a literal wave of goosebumps when we heard that faint scratching start up again. This time we bolted into action, and she threw the car into reverse pretty quickly. Suddenly she screamed, There's someone there! Oh my God! As she saw a figure dive into a nearby bush lit up from the reverse lights. I looked but didn't see anything. We were both in 100% panic mode and practically skidded back onto the road. The rest of the drive back into California was unremarkable, but we did have a motorcycle tail us for almost of the way back after that. From a decent distance luckily, but seeing that faint light bobbing far behind us gave us the creeps on top of everything else. Probably unrelated, but who knows. Everything felt creepy and wrong for the rest of the night. Be careful on Highway 299 in Oregon, you guys. Next story. My daddy's not a trucker, but he used to take me with him to go to various cities and provinces to deliver some packages. I remember this creepy night since it happened when I was a teenager. We were driving across a highway at night time, maybe around 9 p.m. We were talking, laughing, and I was joking with him, and all of a sudden, he slammed his brakes on, and I almost hit the windshield. I was like, Dad, what's wrong? Turned around, his face was so pale, and he said, I hit a girl. Did you see that? I hit her. And he was about to open the door and walk to the front of the car to check it out. But I told him I didn't see any girl, and he stopped opening the door. He tried to look outside, but everything was dark, and all I could see was the empty road. There was no blood, no dead body, nothing. The beam range from the car was bright enough to see 45 meters ahead. When he calmed down, he didn't say a thing and kept driving. I didn't say a single word as well because the atmosphere was really weird and creepy. When we reached the destination, my dad asked me again, You didn't see that girl? The girl with long black hair and dressed in white? At this time, I looked at my dad, didn't say a word, and shook my head. My dad never mentioned that story anymore, not to anyone in the family. For some reason, I didn't even tell that story to my siblings as well. Next story. Well, I was a taxi driver in Georgia, and one time I got a call about an $80 round trip to the outskirts of town. The GPS said 30 minutes, but for some reason it ended up taking me an hour and a half. It was the last call of the day, and I had just started a week ago, and I wanted to make an impression, so I took the call and picked up three ladies, all dressed like hookers, to someone's house, where we picked up three more apparent hookers, and the whole way they were quiet as hell. Made me nervous. Anyway, we're on our way to the location when I started running out of gasoline. I put in the GPS to a gas station three times. All of them were closed. The closer we got to the location, the less and less there were street lights and gas stations and stores and more dirt roads and forest. Eventually, I had to ask them where the F we were going, and they said, just go, we'll pay you. And I thought, as far as we've been, and as far as we're going, you better pay me, God damn it! Someone's better pay me, or heads are going to roll. We went down a 
dirt road on a mountain for what seemed like 20 minutes and found one lone trailer in the middle of a farm surrounded by forests where my signal didn't even catch. The ladies all went inside to fetch me the cash and I hung out in my van like 30 minutes as they all came in, came out, came in, argued about who's going to pay me eventually. One butch look, scary ass lady, walked up and handed me $180. All she said was, now, F off. And I said, yes, ma'am. I wasn't about to argue with whatever was going on, so I left and getting back was a hard time. I took so many wrong turns, I ended up in Dallanega, but I found the gas station just as my car decided to die. I had to push it into the racetrack, was able to find an old-ass dusty map, and charge my phone to figure out where I needed to go to get out of this podunk town. I quit taxiing the next week. Too many effing weirdos in this business. Next story. I was working in Thailand. I was driving across the country with my wife and two little kids through the night. We got into a crazy monsoon storm in the mountains of Namano National Park and there had been zero traffic forever. All of a sudden we see a giant tree that had fallen across the road. We had just passed a dangerous area where water had been pouring off of a cliff lake like a waterfall and thought the highway might wash out, so we were kind of trapped. We decided to just wait out the rain before turning around, but it was pretty scary considering how hard it was raining. The tree could have hit our car, and we were aware the park has wild elephants, bears, and leopards. Not that animals would be out in a driving rainstorm attacking a car, but you know, stuff you think about in the dark. Eventually, a huge dump truck pulls up behind us and four guys hop out with no shirts on and carrying machetes. My wife thought we were goners, but they walked past our car and started hacking away at a tree that I would guess was four to six feet thick. Soon, another huge dump truck comes from the other direction and more men jump out with machetes. Soon, there were eight topless guys taking turns just hacking away at this massive tree in a driving rainstorm. After about 30 minutes, they cut through it and almost on cue, the rain stopped. They shoved part of the tree out of the way, waved us through, and we finished the rest of the drive without incident. I now carry a machete in my car, and I can't wait for the day I can rip my shirt off and clear the road for someone else. Next story. It was about 2 a.m., passing through rural Texas, making a f heavy machinery delivery. The route I was taken to this farm was through rural Texas. You know, the type you see in movies that involve a farm in the middle of nowhere type stuff. A house every two miles type deal. And little did I know this route I was going to take was about to lead to the scariest, freakiest experience I've ever had. Hands down, period. I have LED light bars on my truck all over the front, so when there's no oncoming traffic, I can see literally for a mile. So I'm driving down the road, minding my own business, when I can see something far off in the distance with my lights. And the closer and closer I get, it looks more and more like a person. About 200 yards from what appears to be a person, I can make out that it's a girl because of the long hair and light colored clothes she has on. So I slow down as not to scare this girl walking in the road and turn my brights off so I don't blind her. Truck lights are bright enough as is, so I could see her just fine without it at this point. As I got closer, she turned. And when she did, my CB radio started making some slight static. And as I passed by, I swear she had absolutely no face at all. It looked like a hollow shell. I'm getting antsy just thinking about it. I've never flown through gears so fast in my entire life, especially with a heavy load. It had to be doing at least 70 before I finally came back to my senses. I called the police about it. And the worst part was, they said I'm not the first person to call this in. Through the years, they've had people call it in with similar descriptions of a girl walking down the road in the early morning hours, and when she turns, she has a hollowed out face. The sheriff I talked to told me about an accident that happened years back. A girl in her 20s was struck and killed by a truck speeding down that road in the early morning hours, and it dragged her so far down the road, it ground her face down to nothing on the asphalt, and she was described as having long hair and wearing light colored clothes the exact same description as I saw that night. Needless to say, I will never be taking that route again if I have another delivery. Ever.